the snap. Lawson's back. He hands it off. Oh. 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 Buffalo recovers. Oh, the Welcome to Kyle Anthony's UFC betting show. I am Kyle Anthony and welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the prediction show for UFC on ESPN 12. Dustin Poirier versus Dan Hooker. We've got two free plays that we're going to talk about on this card, as well as on top of that, I do have two props that I do want to talk about as well on each one of these fights. So I'm going to have one free play and a prop on that fight, and then as well as another free play and a prop on that as well. I'll get into how I structure those in a minute, um, but the first thing we'll talk about is I am back. I am back from vacation. It's good to be back. I had an amazing time out there. Sun, sand, beach, drinks pool, uh, beautiful weather for the entire week that I was out there for, really enjoyed myself, I think I enjoyed myself a little bit too much out there, but uh, really enjoyed myself, and um, as well as I was out there with a beautiful girl, and the thing that was not beautiful was the plays on Saturday night, very upset about that, not a great showing overall, we come back from a 5 in 1 night the night before, or the week before, with all my plays released, including the plus 200 play with um, Calvillo to win by decision. We come back here with some more chalky plays and we don't do very well. Was not happy about that. But again, it's a long run. It's a long marathon. Right now, overall, for my clients, we are 40% return on investment on my plays. So can't be too uh, upset about that overall. Again, it never feels good when we lose. It's not what we're here for. It's not good when we talk about it. It's always great when we got the winners. But again, we have Really, really done some great things here on this show with the client plays overall. Made a lot of money here. We are still well in profit, and we got to keep going overall. And like I've even said, even when we've come off of winners, I come on this show, on a prediction show, and I talk about basically saying, hey, we get a winner, guess what? Next week there's another play. And that is, again, the great thing about the UFC. There is no time off. 45, 46 events in the year. A lot of time to be capping. Basically, it's nonstop. After this card, we are off for a week, which is going to be nice. I think it's going to be nice for a little bit, but then we're back to about four in a row, somewhere in there. A great card coming at UFC 251, so a lot of great things happening overall. Uh, so again, we're going to have the two free plays and the two props, and people ask me all the time, how do I structure these? How do I, you know, and, and I have talked to them, you know, sparingly throughout. Basically, each event, I have a lotted amount of money from my bankroll that I use, and on my client plays, I'm structuring them and basically, you know, 75, 80% of them are going to be on client plays. And then as well as I'm going to be sprinkling in the 20%, somewhere around there is going to be on free plays, parlays, value plays in that aspect there. But again, I am always looking at my client plays as where I'm putting predominantly most of my money. Free plays here again, they're sprinkles, they're added value, parlay pieces, things like that, looking to, uh, you know, work in some good pricing overall. So there you have it on that. So the first thing we're going to be talking about is the main event of the evening between Dustin Poirier and Dan Hooker. So right now we've got current line. you got Poirier somewhere around the minus 215, seeing it starting to tick up a little bit there. You've got Hooker around the plus 180, 185, somewhere around there as well. And like I always do, I like to go over last three fights for each fighter, dive into it a little bit, see what we see, see what kind of pass the victory one has over the other, and then if the line actually makes sense to place a bet. So, um... First person we're going over is Dustin Poirier. Now, three fights ago, he went against Eddie Alvarez. Now, this was the second time that they had fought. Um, first time that they fought, it was an illegal knee by Eddie. Uh, landed a big shot on Dustin. Ended the fight. They ended up running it back again. And the first time, I mean, they went at it like just completely... You know, they just did not care. They stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and just started throwing haymakers, big bombs, a brawl, and then it ensued into the illegal knee. But in this shot, in, in this position here, early they actually kind of, that first round, they actually were a little bit hesitant. They both kind of stood their ground, gave uh, gave some space. And everyone knows that Poirier has that great boxing, good footwork from the outside. Alvarez is more of a brawler, wrestler, wants to get in tight, make it dirty. And 
right away you saw how good Poirier's jab is. I mean, he's got one heck of a jab. Again, he comes, he has that more of that background, but great jab, great really sets a lot of his combinations up with the jab, and then he goes in with the big hooks, and he's got the power to be able to put people out. And then going into that second round is when they actually, you know, they went from the first round kind of taking it easy, and then they went into that second round, and boy, they just kind of let it fly again. Big shots from each shot again, and then this is another spot um, where there was an illegal, illegal shot from Eddie Alvarez. Eddie was able to get some good top control, on Poirier, which did not look good, up against the fence, and and Alvarez throws the 12-6 elbow, you cannot do that, it cannot be going straight down, has to be at an angle of some sort, and they make him stand up, and in that spot, I mean, I think already, already Alvarez was slightly hurt, in that spot there, you take a look, and then Poirier just pours it on, and lands some big shots, it looked like Alvarez was tired, he got hurt with some big shots, and Poirier goes out there and gets the knockout victory in the second round. Good showing by him. A little bit concerned that he was in a bad spot, but Poirier goes out there and does get that victory. Two fights ago, he fought Max Holloway. This is for the interim title. This is basically who he's going to be fighting um, Khabib in the next fight. And Max Holloway was coming up in weight. Now, this was a position here where, you know what, Max, there's a lot to like about Max Holloway. Max Holloway has... Great striking, very versatile, uh, has a ton of cardio, big output, a lot of big things going on there. But the part here that was a big, big issue was the size difference. And you, everyone always wanted Max Holloway to kind of move up in weight. And in this spot here, you really see that Max Holloway is not as big as you really think. He's definitely kind of in that middle range between these two divisions more. But in this spot here, you saw how big Poirier was compared to Max Holloway. And right away, you saw the power difference. I mean, the power difference from what Poirier was giving through Holloway. Holloway had the value, more of the, I mean, the volume, more of the pitter-patter shots. He, you know, he was landing, but Poirier was more looking to really pour it on him and keep landing big shots. And, and Max Holloway, not that he was walking through uh, I'm sorry, uh, um, Dustin was not walking through Max's shots, but partially he was. You could tell that he wasn't concerned as much with the power compared to some of these guys that, that Dustin has faced. We're talking about Gaethje and Tom Alvarez and some of these guys that do have that power. Um, in the spot here, he was really able to kind of get away from that. He was kind of able to, to get away from worrying about the power shots. And this was a spot here where he kept moving forward, really landing some big shots. Um, and, and Max, another thing that... <clears throat> excuse me, that Max was um, uh, uh, not able to do as much, was Dustin was really able to put the pressure on. Dustin was able to really get in close and force Max to not really able to utilize all of his limbs, really work from the outside. And when he needed to, he took a break and came back in and really lunged forward with some big shots. I think the only time that Dustin was really in trouble was maybe he showboated a little bit or maybe he was really going in for the kill. Besides for that, I think he had this very well-handed. It was an easy decision victory for him. Some people thought Max had a little bit closer of a fight there. But to me, it was a very one-sided uh, fight for Dustin. He goes out there and gets that victory. Um, and then most recently, he fought Khabib Nurmagomedov for the title. This is a fight here where I can't really break this fight down. I don't. I, I did watch, of course, and I've seen it multiple times. Uh, I don't think a lot of this goes into Dan Hooker uh, and what Hooker does. But in this fight against Khabib, I mean, Khabib, Khabibed him. Uh, he ground and pounded him. I mean, there was even a point where I think it was in between maybe that that first and second, or maybe the second or third, but. Uh, one of those in between rounds, um, Dustin talking to his cornerman and basically saying he sat down and said, I can't get this guy off me. I mean, that's basically what everybody says when they're fighting against uh, Khabib. He goes out there, mauls him, gets a good, um, uh, a good position, sinks in a choke, ends the fight in the third round. Poirier loses that fight. Again, you can't blame him. That's a, a situation where Khabib is just a monster. So he goes out there and he does not beat um, uh, Khabib or Magomedov. The other side, you've got Dan Hooker. Dan Hooker, again, plus 184, roughly in that position. Three fights ago, he fought James Vick. James Vick is Mr. Glass Jaw. I think we all know that at this point. I think he's, uh, he's in his last four fights, he's 0-4. Three of them coming by brutal knockout. Really, things are not going well for James Vick, who was talking a lot of trash coming up uh, before he actually ended up losing those four fights. But um, this is not much, again, to break down. Going inside, good combination from Hooker. Hooker landed some nice shots. He's got some good kickboxing, good distance management. But again, it was just, you got to land one on, on Vic. He goes down. So in this spot here, Hooker goes out there, gets the first round knockout against James Vic. Two fights ago, he fought Al Iaquinta. This is a fight here where I think a lot of people are making a lot 
of this fight as in what Hooker did. Now, Hooker went out there and did get this decision victory, but a lot of people are really, you know, they talk up Ally Quinta striking, and I am just not one of those people that really believe that Ally Quinta has that capability to really go in there. You've seen him, you know, we've seen him, you know, without a doubt, we've seen him land some big shots, knock some people out. I think it was, you know, Diego Sanchez or somebody, you know, he knocked somebody out early and he's, but he's more the wrestling guy. He's more wants to get in there. He does not have a technical skills and up against a guy like Hooker is a great matchup for Dan Hooker to stand outside, work his combinations, you know, pick and choose his shots, um, had some, um, uh, some more of the reach, had reach advantage as well. There was a lot of things that you really had to like about Hooker going into this. So the very simplistic striking of Iaquinta is not what you're going to see against Poirier. So in this fight here, you did see Hooker go out there, land some big shots, move forward on him, pretty much dictated the pace of the fight, dropped him a couple times. I mean, it was really a one-sided fight for Hooker. He looked good in that spot. He goes out there and gets the decision victory against Al Iaquinta. And then most recently, he fought Paul Felder. Paul Felder here, this is a fight where they're on home soil for, for Dan Hooker. And a tough fight. I mean, this was, if you have not seen this fight, I thought this fight was really a fantastic fight. Two guys standing, brawling, uh, a five-round war overall. They really just kind of laid it on each other throughout the fight. And, you know, the, the, the one part here was I did like a more distance management, again, that you saw from Dan Hooker. A lot of times Dan Hooker does want to get a little bit closer, but he utilized his range really nicely, circled nicely, had great counters. Felder's really good in the clinch. And Felder looked to do that, I think, a little too much. Felder really wanted to get in the clinch. He is fantastic when it comes to the elbows. He really shreds guys up in tight, um, you know, with his dirty boxing. Even the Muay Thai clinch, very good in there. And, and those are the things that, that Felder just couldn't really wrap his hands around. Although, it was a very close fight. And this was a fight I actually thought Hooker lost this fight. I thought it was a very, very close fight. Um, at home, split decision, does go to Dan Hooker, but a close fight overall, I thought his jab looked great, I thought he did a lot of great things out there, so he goes out there and he does beat Paul Felder by split decision. So with it all being said, we take a look at these two guys. I mean, the first thing that we obviously got to talk about again is, is Poirier striking. I mean, Poirier has fantastic boxing overall, great footwork, a guy that really can move around, utilize his angles, utilize his combinations. And again, another guy that sets up, just as Hooker does, sets up a lot with his jab, works his jab, and then starts to come inside overall. And the thing that I do like about what Dustin also has done is that he's really added the leg kick into his game. Now, this is something that a lot of guys are starting to use. It really is kind of taking over MMA, uh, that guys that can really land that in a consistent basis, slows the opponent down, how much damage it does. You know, you're, you're basically striking a legitimately a bone, um, not much there to really take the strike, you know, really slows down the fighter, demobilizes him, allows him to be struck. So Poirier's really added that to his game. I think that's something that's very, very good for him, for a guy that really likes to go out there and just throw hands. Um, the pressure is another big thing here also. I think that really is something that Poirier is very good at. And when he needs to, he, he really utilizes that. Now, guys like Alvarez and guys that can take a beating have not did not fold until later on to the fight. But it depends what goes on. Now, you've got both of these guys here with Hooker and uh, Poirier. Both of these guys have toughness. I mean, there's no question. Both of these guys can really plow through. They can really go, you know, the distance. They can really take shots and throw shots. They have cardio, both of them. And the other side, you've got the kickboxing of Dan Hooker. I think that's really a good spot for him where he's able to stand on the outside, utilize some of his range, good combinations, good distance management. I think both of them do a lot of things overall that are good and as well as the output. I think both of them have a nice output. Uh, the part here that I think changes a lot of this is the cage. Um, I think a lot of this is going to change in the cage here. And I think that really favors Poirier. I think the fact that you know, a lot of things that Hooker likes to do is likes to circle. He likes to be outside. He likes to utilize some of his kickboxing. He likes to, you know, you know, stay at range and, and really kind of stand outside. And when he needs to, he comes inside. And a guy like Poirier is willing to bang. He's willing to get close. He's got the power. He's got the chin. They're both tough overall. But the fact that the small cage and his big striking output from, from Poirier, I think there's a lot to like about Poirier. Now, you've got the prices starting to tick up. 
Um, I think right here is a good price for Poirier. I just think Dan Hooker has been a kind of a, a victim of circumstance a little bit here. I mean, you, you know, beating James Vick, not very impressive. You know, beating Ally Quinta. Again, I'm not big on Ally Quinta. He squeaked out a, a, a win against Paul Felder when Hooker was home turf. A uh, very close fight, which I thought uh, Felder won that fight. And then you see the, this, the murderer's row that that Dustin Poirier has faced. I'm not saying that Hooker is a bad fighter by any means, but I like Dustin Poirier here. I think that there's so much like about him. I think a small cage is going to really favor him and going to force uh, the boxing more of Dan Hooker than the kickboxing of Dan Hooker. Shorting, shorting that distance up, allowing him to get closer. I think that that's going to be a great spot. So I'm going to be taking Dustin Poirier to defeat Dan Hooker. And I'm also going to be sprinkling in, again, this is a very small bet. This is another prop bet, I'm, uh, one of the prop bets, is the price on this to go the distance. Uh, the price on this just to go the distance is plus 240. Uh, I think that's a great price because both of these guys are durable. Both of these guys are willing to trade. Yes, it's going to be a small cage, and that is slightly more, probably why the number is a little bit higher. So I think that this is a spot here where the plus 240 is juicy enough to sprinkle a little bit of something on it. So that's the other plan we have. We have Dustin Poirier to defeat Dan Hooker, and also the fight will go to decision plus 240. So those are my two plays, my one free play for the main event. The other one we'll be talking about is the co-main event of the evening, uh, unless they change it, um, between Mike Perry and Mickey Gall. You've got Mike Perry. He's starting to squeak up now a little bit too, minus 280. You've got Mickey Gall, who's plus 210. Uh, and that's the one thing about this particular card is the odds are pretty wide. I mean, you've got a ton of, uh, of odds, minus 350, plus 280. I mean, you've got very wide range here uh, throughout most, I would say 90% of the fights look to be basically around that, where they're the, the, the over the minus 200. Minus. So it's very interesting how these how these lines actually are. Um, but again, we can't always dig for underdogs. We gotta find the right price, find winners, and place our bets. Um, so the first thing we're going to be talking about, we got Mike Perry again, minus 280, Mickey Gall, plus 210. And um, first thing we're going to be talking about is Mike Perry. I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker. Uh, but Mike Perry, three fights ago, fought um, Alex Oliveira. And this was a great fight for Perry. Now, Perry went out there and he did get this decision victory. But I'm pretty high on Alex Oliveira as just his skill set. He's known for, you know, he's very well-rounded. He's durable kind of guy. He's got a lot of, he's very versatile with his striking. But early you saw that, that, that Oliveira was was really landing some nice shots. And then from there, Perry just kind of sat, got got control, and really started landing some big shots. They kind of went at it. I mean, it's another crazy one where Perry picked him up and threw him over his head, and some crazy stuff happened there. But I like what I saw from Perry in that spot because Perry, we know, has had issues with really, I guess it's fight IQ, you know, where he's definitely not made the right decisions. He's, even when he fought um, against Donald Cerrone four fights ago, which was the fight before this, you know, he, he took... Took down Cowboy, and and which is probably the the only spot where well not the only spot but a spot where Cowboy's gonna have definitely more success. And Perry looked to take him down wasn't the best thing because he was able to he was getting he got submitted by the end of that first round. But overall though, I, I like what I saw from Perry against Oliveira. So Perry goes out there, he gets a decision victory. He looked good in that spot. Two fights ago, he fought Vicente Luque. Luque is an animal. This is another a big fight here where two guys willing to stand, willing to trade, willing to throw big shots, and both of them are brawlers. They went in there and they literally just brawled. Both of them looked to take big shots. Perry was landing big shots early, looked good, and and, I, and it was almost that he was basically picking up where he left off against um, Oliveira, but... After that, it was just, Vicente was just standing from the outside, landing great combinations, working from the outside, and Perry was really looking for the big bomb. And that's one thing that I think if he changes in his game, he could be a lot more effective, is if he really just kind of worked combinations. He's always looking for the barbarian shot to really just obliterate a guy, where you've got a guy who's going to pitter-patter you for most of the round and squeak out a round, compared to him just looking for the big knockout. So... In the spot here, uh, Vicente Luque does get the victory, split decision. This was another fight where I actually thought Perry won. Uh, he did get his face smashed in uh, by the end of that third round, but I thought that he had done enough to win the two rounds and get the victory, but very, very, very close um, overall. But um, Perry does lose that fight. 
against uh, most recently Jeff Neal he fought. Jeff Neal was a minus 250 favorite coming into this. Uh, Neal is a beast. I mean, he's another guy that's really going to be a trajectory of this division moving up without a doubt. Perry was very, very patient. And that's something that he could bring into this fight going up against Gall. Who knows? But he was very patient. And then he was almost too patient because then uh, Neal landed a big leg, uh, leg kick to the head, dropped him. Uh, Neil puts a ground and pound, ends it in the uh, the first round by KO, so he loses that fight there. Mickey Gall, three fights ago, he fought Greg uh, George Sullivan. Now, you can see here, now this is another thing where competition level is always important. And, you know, here he fought George Sullivan. George Sullivan, he did beat George Sullivan, first round submission victory, but George Sullivan is 0-3 out of his last three UFC fights. And this was a spot where Sullivan basically just gave up his back, Gall got a good spot, get him, got a rear naked choke in the first round. Very ugly fight for Sullivan overall, and uh, Gull gets the victory there. Uh, two fights ago was more of a fight that I think you could take into consideration what's going to be happening Saturday night against Perry. And uh, two fights ago was against um, Diego Sanchez. And this is a fight here where I'm not very high on Diego Sanchez just to begin with, but he really kind of showed the path to victory to beating Gall and the fact that he just put pressure on him. I mean, the one thing about Gall that everybody says is, you know, he's got the he's got the ground credentials. He is a Gracie Jiu Jitsu brown belt, um, but he does has not really showed the takedown ability, the success of takedown ability, top control. You know, good transitions when he's on the bottom. You know, against Sullivan, he was able to get just kind of Sullivan gave up his back. Got, got him from behind, choked him out. There wasn't this great transition of movements that allowed Gall to look like this great grappler. So in this spot here, Diego just brought it to him. Diego was, you know, early on you saw that uh, Gall looked at, looked at almost, you know, hoping for the weak chin uh, of, of Diego. Didn't land anything good in that first minute and a half. And after that, Diego did what he does. He kind of made it dirty, got inside. There was, you know, some ground and pound. First round was really all Diego Sanchez. He was landing big shots. Really pressured him, and that's something that Perry, who's a guy that's more of a bulldozer kind of guy, could really look to that as an easy path to victory for him. That yes, you know, some you know, it's gonna again a smaller cage is gonna force and induce more action here. And against um, Diego Sanchez, there was really nothing that Gall did. I mean, his striking was very basic. He didn't really do much. He was pulling guard a lot because he couldn't get Sanchez down. But Sanchez goes out there, gets a TKO victory, really went out there, ground and pounded him, and even Gall was completely gassed by the end of that fight. So Gall goes out there and loses. And then he takes a big step down against Salman uh, Tarahi. And, um, and against Tarahi, this is another fight where, you know, a big step down and, and Salman is 0-3 in the UFC. Um, so his last two fights have, you know, combined for their last six fights are 0 and 6 against, um, other fighters before they fought Gall. So, I mean, and even after beating Gall, they're 0 and 8. So not the most impressive guys that he has beat or had to really fight up against. Um, so in this fight here, it was another spot where, you know, this is a fight where really I thought that they set this fight up to really make Gall look good. You know, you know, Mickey has, you know, you know, people like him. He's a likable guy. He's, you know, younger within the UFC, you know, doesn't have as many fights. And this was a fight to really gotta gotta give him another submission victory, give him the chance. And this was an ugly fight. I mean, both guys in this spot were just kind of wildly throwing combinations, you know, ugly um, ground, you know, uh, uh, gr grappling exchanges where, you know, one would slip out, the other would slip out, the other would get top control, the other would slip out. I mean, nobody really had anything going on. Again, you saw Gall just looking tired early in this fight, did not have a lot to really put the fight away. Um, he did go out there and get this victory, but I thought it was a very ugly fight overall. Um, even in a win, it did not look good. Uh, so with that all being said, I mean, you've got the thing here, you've got uh, Mike Perry, you've got the power, you've got the strength. I mean, he's the kind of guy that's going to be able to body slam you if, you, if, if you grab a, you know, a limb. Um, but the part here is that he's wild. And that's the big issue. I think that some people are hesitant to sometimes bet, uh, Mike Perry is the fact of that, that he can kind of go out there, be wild, not really be as smart, not look to just kind of stay at, at, at you know, with whatever his strategy is, because the strategy can't always just be, you know, throwing one big bomb. So I think he gets away from some of that. Um, and I think also that, you know, if you look at what he's done and the kind of guys that he has fought, he has fought another tough, 
tough. He has never backed down. If you even go back through maybe five or six of the last fights, most of them he is a big underdog because he's fighting really some, some top-level guys, some guys that have been around, good veterans, uh, top-level fighters, up-and-comers like Jeff Neal that at the time, you know, even Jeff Neal was a, was a minus 250 favorite. Now he's starting to get more shine because Jeff Neal continues to do well and, and, and he's continuing to um, look good. So, you know, that's the kind of thing here where you've got somebody like Mickey Gall on the other side. He's got the jiu-jitsu. That's going to be a part that I think some people are going to gravitate towards if they're going to be betting Gall that, hey, he can submit uh, Mike Perry. But the part here is that, he, again, he cannot take anybody down. He has struggled taking people down. He has not looked good taking people down. And even, again, no control uh, once he has the body or a body lock or, or some kind of position where he should have, you know, more control. And as well as the striking is just lackluster. I mean, one thing for sure is that he has very basic striking, completely basic striking, and even his striking defense is nothing exciting at all. I mean, he really allows himself to be hit. I mean, even against um, uh, Tarahi, Tarahi was landing a couple beautiful hooks, doesn't have much power, but a guy like Mike Perry, if he lands a couple of those, he's going to put your lights out. So in this spot here, you know, I think it's it's an easy pick for me here, even at this price. Mike Perry minus two eighty. It is a little bit on the on the chalkier side here, but again, I just don't see anything that Mike uh, that Mickey uh, Mickey Gall does that can give Mike Perry even at you know again if Mike Perry had a little bit more you know honed in a couple of these things I think this line is up to 350 but again Mike Perry being the wild side it's kind of pulled that line down a little bit and again the fact that Gall has an opportunity to you know the ground game that people are saying I think pulls this line down a little bit more I think this should be actually spread a lot more overall I like Mike Perry here I think he goes out there I think he easily gets the job done there's nothing that Mickey Gall does that I think really is exciting um but also my prop on this as well is there's two of them here that i thought were interesting uh the one that i'm going to be sprinkling on is gonna be mike perry via knockout that's minus 120 that's getting you off the bigger number that's giving you a chance to kind of leverage a little bit of that as well um by decision is plus 340 so you know it's a little juicy if you think it's going to go the distance but i think that the small cage is really going to be a good spot for Mike Perry to really pressure, it's not going to give Gall a lot of a lot of opportunity to kind of move around the cage, and as well as Gall does not have cardio. So with Mike Perry with the pressure, smaller cage, nowhere for Gall to go. I think he goes out there and gets the knockout. So I will be betting Mike Perry to get the victory, and as well as a sprinkle on the prop KO for Mike Perry to get the victory. So those are my free plays for UFC on ESPN 12. Um, we got Dustin Poirier to defeat Dan Hooker. We also have, um, uh, what was the other one? Um, oh, uh, by the, uh, the fight to go to a decision, uh, plus 240. Then we have Mike Perry to win. And then we also have the prop Mike Perry via KO minus 120. Those are my plays. We will have the bet review show out on Sunday. Uh, and again, we have a week off after this. So, you know, everybody enjoy yourself there and um, definitely like, subscribe, get involved with everything. Kyle Anthony um, at Kyle Anthony UFC on Twitter. Hit me up there. I got my client plays up on Wager Talk. Take a look at that as well. And uh, this is Kyle Anthony's UFC betting show, and I'll see you next time.